look at these individuals. We don't really speak about these individuals as much. It looks like most of the times, and these are actually the people we're going to speak about right now, these are a few of the 12 famous Imams that the Shiites make a big deal about. And they call the 12 Imams and they call them Ma'asum and they call them, they give them various different positions and so on. According to the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, these were great scholars, awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and great individuals that did not hold the beliefs that people who claim to follow them uh, in this way uh, um, uh, hold as their beliefs. So we, it's important that we understand some of this because there's not much else to say about this chapter. And the reason is that most of the hadith are very similar. So let's look at the first one here. It's related from Abu Al-Khattab Ziyad ibn Yahya, from Abdullah ibn Maymun, from Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Ja'far ibn Muhammad is the famous Ja'far al-Sadiq. Ja'far the truthful one. He is one of the Imams, the great Imams that the Shiites quote quite often. And the reason why he was called Sadiq wasn't his name. Sadiq was a title. Sadiq means truthful. His name was Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Um, so the reason why he was called a Sadiq is because of his absolute truthfulness. He was a very truthful individual. And you know, many people are truthful. Why would you call a certain person very truthful? Because maybe they're even more refined in their truth, that they're very particular about their truth. They, be, they try to be very clear. Maybe they even in some compromising situations, they still told the truth. Otherwise, many people are truthful. So why not call everybody truthful? Well, the reason why certain people are called truthful is because they, they sit, that particular aspect dominates. Like for example, when it says, wa ahyahum Uthman, we hear that in the khutbah every week. Uthman radiallahu an had the greatest level of modesty. I mean, the other sahaba had modesty as well. But his modesty was, you could tell that he was extra modest. You could, you could just tell that he was very refined in his modesty. So that's why he was called Ja'far al-Sadiq. His ahadith have been related by Imam Bukhari in his uh, in his history book, Imam Muslim and uh, the Sunan, all of those have related from him. His mother's name was Farwa, bint al-Qasim, ibn Muhammad, ibn Abi Bakr. This is a point to, point to, uh, uh, to keep in mind. That Ja'far al-Sadiq, right, the great descendant, the great Imam of the Shiites as they call him, his mother was Farwa, daughter of Qasim ibn Muhammad, Ibn Abi Bakr, a great granddaughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Where's the enmity gone between the two? If there was enmity such as claimed by the Shiites, for example, then why would you even marry a descendant of the one who cheated your father, or your great grandfather, or your ancestors, or whatever it is? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. You'll see that there's a lot of intermarriage between the four Khulafa and their descendants. This was Farwa. Daughter of Qasim, daughter of Muhammad, do, uh, son of, uh, sorry, Qasim, son of Muhammad, son of Abu Bakr, radiallahu an. Sufyan al-Thawri, the great Hadith scholar, said to him one day, um, I want you to relate a Hadith to me, and until you don't relate a Hadith to me, I'm not going to stand up. You must relate a Hadith to me. So Ja'far, rahimahullah, he said, I'm, I should relate a Hadith to you. You have so many ahadith because uh, Sufyan al-Thawri was a great hadith scholar, one of the one of the major mountains in that regard. Sufyan said, "No, he said that to him that how am I going to relate to you?" Then he started relating. He says, "If Allah, so he gave him some advice. He says, in an amallahu alayka bi ni'matin, if Allah subhanahu wa taala grants you a bounty, fa ahbabta baqa'aha." And if you have a bounty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something new, a nice house, nice car, nice this, nice that, whatever it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, and you, you like it that it remain with you, and you have that bounty for a long time and forever, then what should you do? فَأَكْثِرْ مِنَ الْحَمْدِ Then you should abundantly praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should do a lot of hamd, alhamdulillah. Every time you think of that bounty, you should say alhamdulillah. 
La in shakartum la azidannakum. So this was, you could say another way. Wa shukr alayha. And you should make shukr on it. Fa inna Allah azza wa jalla qala fi kitabihi la in shakartum la azidannakum. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book that if you are thankful and grateful, then we will give you even more. Another thing. This is something we really need to do. Right? This is something many of us miss out on. And then the bounty, uh, bounty goes away. Another one is that, وَإِنِ اسْتَبْطَعْتَ الرِّزْقِ فَأَكْثِرْ مِنَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ If you find that your sustenance is very slow in coming, right? you're not making enough money, your money isn't lasting, you've got no barakah, right? your business isn't doing well. All of these things, subhanAllah. فَأَكْثِرْ مِنَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ then abundantly do istighfar and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For in Allah ta'ala qal istaghfiru rabbakum innahu kana ghaffara yursil is sama alaykum midrara wa yumdidkum bi amwali wa banina wa yaj'al lakum jannatin wa yaj'al lakum anhara. So then he quotes a verse from Surah Nuh in the Quran. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, seek forgiveness from your Lord, make istighfar, He is the most forgiving, He will send the rains from the heavens to you in abundance, and He will give you from wealth, He will give you of the wealth and children, progeny, and He will make for you orchards, He will give you, provide you with orchards, and He will give you water, He will provide you water if you need irrigation, whatever you need. So this is, everything is covered, children, wealth, crops, you know, whatever field and business you may be in, it's all, it's all covered in there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, the same thing. So essentially, if we do have problems in money-wise, we should have a regimen of istighfar. Minimum a hundred a day. Best thing is get a tasbih, a subha. Right? You know, forget this whole business about it being bid'ah. It just use it as a tool to count. Just like you use the computer, you know, you could tap on the keyboard, one, 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 and do a hundred, you know. You could do whatever you want. Alright? You could write the numbers in your phone if you want to. It's just a tool, subhanAllah. People need to get over this. Just a hundred, is the first thing you get up in the morning, one thing before you go uh, to sleep at night, just find a time for yourself, hundred istighfar. And if, you, if we're finding that our sustenance, you know, we're finding it tough to find a job or to get, you know, decent income or whatever, two hundred, three hundred, increase it. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. You can do longer ones. Astaghfirullah min kulli dhambi wa atubu ilayhi. There's numerous istighfar. You can get the book uh, Hassan Basri's collection of 70 istighfar, which are really powerful. There's many types of istighfar. Then he said another one which is really beneficial. Ya Sufyan, idha karrabaka amrun min sultanin aw ghayrih. Have you got problems with the authorities? They're bothering you. Not that you've done something wrong, right? Now you're trying to escape. That's a different story. You should make tawbah. But if it's where somebody's harassing you, if a matter of grief and sorrow has come to you from the sultan, from the leader, from the, the ruler, or anybody else for that matter, somebody else is bothering you, right? Uh, you know, extortion, uh, some gang is bothering you, some neighbor is really causing you problems, some guy is always in your way, Frightening you, scaring you, your children, whatever it is. فَأَكْثِرْ مِنْ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ Then abundantly read لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ There is no ability or might, there is no power or might to do anything good or to abstain from evil إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ Except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mighty and the majestic. He says, make sure you do abundantly of that if that's your problem, because they are the two wings of the opening. If you want release, opening, a way out, then these are the wings that you need to fly out of this problem. فَإِنَّهَا جَنَاحَا الْفَرَجِ وَكَنْزٌ مِّن كُنُوزِ الْجَنَّةِ And they are treasures from the treasures of paradise. Then he said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us through this. Then he said, Istanzilu rizqa bi sadaqa. In Islam many things are paradoxical. He said, cause your sustenance to decrease and come down by giving sadaqa. Spend in the path of Allah and Allah will send down to you your sustenance. Ajib. 
essentially you could understand it that sometimes the gutter gets blocked there's too much dirt in there and the water can't flow you start removing some of that dirt and the water just suddenly starts flowing and you remove it all and it flows abundantly and essentially consider that to be the same thing we get many our uh, our sins and uh, maybe the source of our income and the money that we get it has pollution i mean subhanallah it, it'd be very it'd be quite amazing for anybody to claim that our source of income whether you wherever you get your money from is 100% halal from top down in our current monetary system it is ajeeb we need to give lots of sadaqah to purify our wealth so zakat is the basic purification 2.5% but sadaqah the more we purify it is ajeeb allah will give us more because it will be clean wealth it will attract more then he says wa hasinu amwalakum bi zakat and you want more you want risk to come down you give sadaqah but if you want whatever you have to be protected whatever you already have if you want that to be protected hasinu amwalakum bi zakat then give zakat so zakat is at least you get whatever you have protected and if you want more give sadaqah wa man ahzana walidayhi faqad aqamahuma and whoever causes grief to his two parents then it's like he's made them barren it's is as though they don't have children because what point is a child that gives them grief and he said a number of other things he said that whoever hits his thighs when a musiba rises then his sins uh, then his uh, his rewards are all eliminated wa man ihtafara li akhihi bi'ran saqata fiha and whoever digs a well for his brother will fall into it himself if you plot against your brother to make them fall into something haram something wrong uh, to make them miserable to cause them grief to give them a sense of loss you will fall into it yourself wa man dakhala as-sufaha haqara wa man khalata al-ulama waqara and whoever enters upon and stays around with idiots foolish people then he will become humiliated cuz they're going to say stupid things to you and you're going to have to take it because you want to sit there they're going to talk in a vulgar language they're going to be saying all sorts of things they might come out with things that they want to smoke and do other things with or they might do strange actions and you'll be along with them but then whoever joins together and sits among the ulama then he gains respect and honor wa man dakhala madakhil as-su uttuhima and whoever casually enters into evil places then he even if he doesn't have bad intention he will then be blamed somebody is going to slander him with something because you're causing suspicion one day ja'far as-sadiq he was a contemporary of imam abu hanifa imam abu hanifa actually had a conversation with him as well so the ruler at the time was ja'far al-mansur the abbas one of the first abbasid al khalifs and he was a bit angry that day ja'far al-mansur because a fly had really bothered him right a fly had really like tested his patience it seems he said to mansur said to him ja'far as-sadiq when he came in rahimahullah he says aba abdullah lima khalaq allah al-dhubab oh abu abdullah why did allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create this fly he must have bothered him really you know a lot so what what response did he give him you dhilla bihi al-jababira he created the fly to humiliate the tyrants of this world he said that when you do a good deed it's not complete unless you do three things you do it quickly you don't think it to be too big for yourself so you know you you do it for the sake of allah and you conceal it so you don't show off with it then it's complete it's penetrative insight you know when people really look at this thing with the eye of uh, of uh, iman they they see where things can go wrong people do good deeds but then they show off it they make a big deal out of it they take time in doing it so he's he he's very comprehensive do it quickly you're going to do it do it quickly get it done don't wait i'll do it next week next week next week it never comes just do it do it again next week if you have to 
May Allah give us the tawfiq. And don't think of it too big in your sight. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one to accept it. And He will consider it big if, we, if, if He wants to. And, and keep it concealed. Then his son was Musa al-Kadhim. He is again another one of the Imams. After Ja'far al-Sadiq, his son was Musa al-Kadhim. He was one of the greatest worshippers of his time. He was one of the greatest worshippers of his time. One of the greatest alims and scholars of his time. And one of the most generous people of his time as well. Ashahum a'lamuhum wa a'badu ahli zamanihi. Imam Shafi'i said about him, I mean, subhanallah, this is an Imam. A Shafi'i said about him that the qabr of Musa al kadhim the grave of Musa al kadhim is a tiryaq al mujarrab. A tiryaq means a prescription, a, um, uh, something the doctor can prescribe to you as a cure. He says it is a tried prescription, something that is, has been tested and tried, his, his grave. And his grandson was Ali al-Ridha. Ali al-Ridha. That's another one of the Imams. Ali al-Ridha ibn Musa al-Kadhim. So Musa al-Kadhim's son. And Ja'far al-Sadiq's grandson. He was again a unique individual during his time. That Ma'roof al-Karhi. I'm sure many of us have heard the name Ma'roof al-Karhi. One of the great pious saints of the past. He became Muslim. He accepted Islam on the hands of Musa, uh, on the hands of uh, Ali uh, al Rida, rahimahullah. And this Ma'roof al Karhi was a teacher and the Shaykh of another great Awwali of Allah, whose name was Sari al Saqati. Sari al Saqati, another great, a great one. Ma'roof al Karhi used to say to Sari al Saqati, his student. إِذَا كَانَتْ لَكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ حَاجَةً فَأَقْسِمْ عَلَيْهِ بِي وَعَلِيٍ هَذَا وَعَلِيٍ هَذَا If you ever have a need from Allah, when you're in need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then swear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by me and by this Ali. And Allah will fulfill your oath for you. He is the one who entered into the city of Naysabur. And... Abu Zur'a al-Razi, one of the great hadith scholars of the time, and Muhammad ibn Aslam al-Tusi. As he entered, as this Ali uh, al-Ridha entered, this Abu Zur'a al-Razi and Muhammad ibn Aslam al-Tusi, they came with this huge group of people, a huge group of people, and requesting him to uh, relate hadith to them. So he said, he related, he said, حدثني أبو موسى, الك... أبو... أبو موسى الكاظم أبو موسى الكاظم related to me from his father Ja'far al-Sadiq, he's talking about his grandfathers, who related from Muhammad al-Baqir, who was Ja'far al-Sadiq's father, who related from his father Ali Zayn al-Abidin. Ali Zayn al-Abidin, I mean, an individual. Subhanallah. The son of Ali radiallahu anhu. Sorry, the son of Hussein radiallahu anhu. He relates from his father Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu and the shaheed of Karbala from his father Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anybody listening to this like halfway through they're going to think this is some Shiite speaking. Right. Allah protect us. These are great people that we have to speak about. We have to understand who they were. Right? Just because the Shiites revere them it doesn't mean that we put them down. We put everybody where they are and these were great individuals. May Allah bless them all. He relates from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, who said that my beloved and the, gla- and the source of the coolness of my eyes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam related to me, that Jibreel alayhi salam related to me, that I heard Rabbul Izzah, the Lord of Majesty, Subhana, glorified be he, saying, La ilaha illallah, hisni, faman qalaha dakhala hisni, wa man dakhala hisni, min adabi. The hadith he related was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that La ilaha illallah is my fortress. La ilaha illallah is my castle, my fortress. Whoever enters into it then has entered into my fortress. So whoever says it, whoever says La ilaha illallah has entered into my fortress. And whoever enters into my fort then he is protected from my punishment. And the people who are around writing this, remember the, there was a huge group of people that had come. 
they were more than 20,000. According to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, as related by the commentator here, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said that if you read this chain of narration that we just read from Ali, Ar-Rida, through his, his uh, ancestors, then if you read it on an insane person, he will be relieved from his insanity. See, it's supposed to be very powerful. Well, his son then was Muhammad ibn Ali ar rida his, his son was then Muhammad. Muhammad, Ali, Ja'far. These are the, the kind of names that are quite popular um, in this chain. His son was Muhammad ibn Ali ar rida Again, he, in terms of knowledge and forbearance and clemency, he was an exemplar during his time. Once somebody said to him, give me some advice. Something very brief but very comprehensive. Just make it short. I don't want too much. Just short. He said, Sun nafsaka an aril ajilati wa naril ajila. Sun nafsaka an aril ajilati wa naril ajilati. A play on words but absolutely encompassing everything. He said, Sun nafsak. Protect yourself from the ar. Ar means the blame. Uh, the mark, the evil mark, the negative mark of the dunya, the ajila. So don't do anything negative in this world. And protect yourself from the narul akhira. Arul ajila, narul akhira. Narul akhira means the fire of the hereafter. He said a number of other things. So uh, let's go back to the hadith. I mean, this is the description of these great individuals. Um, let's go back to the hadith. Where Ja'far ibn Muhammad, Ja'far al Sadiq, he relates from his father, Muhammad al Baqir, whose name was Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, his name was Baqir. The word Baqir means, uh, Baqir means to split something. And because his knowledge was very intense and very penetrating, it was as though he had split knowledge right through. Right? And kind of understood it completely. He'd understood its fundamentals and its principles and its branches and the major aspects of knowledge and the, the subtle aspects of knowledge. That's why it's called Baqir. Baqir just means a great scholar in that sense. His mother was Umm Abdullah, daughter of Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was a tabi'i. He was a great tabi'i. He heard Jabir radiallahu an. And Anas radiallahu an. Imam Bukhari and Muslim and others have related from him. And he used to say at night, he used to pray at night, in the middle of the night. He used to say to Allah, Amartani falam a'tamir, wa zajartani falam azdajir, hadha abduka bayna yadayk, wa la a'tathir. He used to say, Oh Allah, you've commanded me, and I've not been able to come through with it. You have told me to refrain from things, and I have been unable to. This is your servant in front of you, and I have no excuse. Confessing his inability. He advised Anas, even though Anas was his teacher in a sense, and was Sahabi. He said, I mean, these were a family of Rasulullah so they had to have something. They had to have the nobility in them. He said, أنزل الدنيا كمنزل نزلت به فارتحلت عنه أو كمال أصبته في منامك فاستيقظت وليس معك Treat the dunya as though it's a place that you stopped at for a while and then you left it. A temporary place that you stopped at a roadside cafe, service station, and then you left it. Or like wealth, which you saw a beautiful dream. And in your dream you received all this wealth. When you woke up there was nothing. In your dream you're this rich man going around. Suddenly you wake up and there's nothing. Subhanallah, such a beautiful example of this dunya. Such an accurate description of this dunya. And he said, وَلَيْسَ مَعَكَ مِنُ شَيْءٍ وَإِنَّمَا هِيَ مَعَ أَهْلِ اللَّهِ وَالْعَامِلِينَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى He says, really, the, the, the people of Allah and the people who are doing the good deeds, they, they, they really have the true knowledge of this and the true worth of this. He used to say that, I've got a brother, I've got a friend, a brother, who is really big in my sight. And the thing which has made him so great in my sight is that the dunya is so small in his sight. That gives me great respect for him. 
Because he doesn't treat the dunya. He said that we normally call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him for things that we love. But then whenever something happens that we dislike, why do we then go against, why do we then do things wrongly against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? His father was Zainul Abidin Ali ibn al Hussein, the son of Hussein radiallahu an. And he is the one that Farazdaq prays greatly in poems. In fact, once it was either Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, one of the great Umayyads, because this was before the Abbasids. He came in, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, I believe, he came into the haram and he had to push through, meaning the crowd didn't open up for him. There was, it was a lot of people as there are always. Suddenly, as he was waiting on the side to go into the sea of people to go and kiss the black stone, another individual suddenly comes up and everybody just moves aside. And he goes calmly and kisses the stone. He knew who it was, but he says, who is this man? So immediately, Farazdaq, who's the famous poet, who's standing around, impromptu, he came up with a poem. And essentially what he said, he's a man who, not only Makkah, but the environs of Makkah, they all know. Right? And then he explained that this was Ali Zainul Abideen. Once this Ali Zainul Abideen, rahimahullah, he went to visit Muhammad ibn Usama ibn Zayd, Usama ibn Zayd's son Muhammad, in his, uh, in his, uh, sick, uh, while he was ill. And he was crying. So he, he said to him, what's wrong with you? What's happened? He said, I have a big debt. I'm in this sickness, but I have a big debt. How much is your debt? He said, 15,000 dinars. 15,000 dinars. 200 dinars is the today is worth about 3 or 4,000 pounds 200 dinars is worth 3 or 4,000 pounds today the gold price is higher but even when it was low it's still worth 2,000 pounds that's the gold nisab 200 dinars this is 15,000 dinars right so work that out now imagine you go to visit somebody and they say I've got this big debt that's why I'm crying what would you do? you'd make some dua for them Ali Zain al Abidin said, Fahuwa alayya. It's on me. I'll take it. Imagine how that person felt. He used to say that, Sadaqatu sir, tutfi'u ghadab al rabb. Spending in charity in secret, in a concealed way, calms the anger of the Lord. Azza wa Jal. He used to constantly keep a sack of. Uh, of flower with him at night time on his back and he used to go around and he used to give it to the fuqara of Medina Munawwara when he passed away it was only when he passed away this was in the darkness of the night it's not like here where you go around even at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock the shops the Turkish shops are open mashallah and people are walking there's still traffic right this was night time nobody knew what was going on he used to go around to give the fuqara but it was only after he died that it was discovered that there were a hundred houses in Medina that relied on him for their basic necessities, their basic food. One day somebody cursed him, somebody swore at him, and he ignored him. And that person must have got irritated. He tried to be a bit more blunt. And he said to him, Iyaka a'ni. Yes, it was you I meant. Because you know sometimes when somebody swears, you kind of ignore them because you're like, oh, he didn't do it to me. Because if you do it to me, then you have to respond. So you're like, oh, you didn't do it. Like, do it somebody else. But the guy was like, no, I, I swore at you. So he said, that's fine. Wa anka a'rid, and it's, I'm ignoring exactly you. You know, I'm ignoring you as well. Don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. You know, Subhanallah. Khudil afwa wa amur bil ma'roof. Just forgive, pardon, overlook. That's what he was acting on. May Allah give us a tawfiq to do this. I mean, we sit here right now and we think we'll do it. We all want to do it. It's just when we get caught at that moment when somebody does swear at us, then we fly off the handle. Because this hadith is not in front of us then. Right? Okay. Subhanallah. That is what I found to be tough. Somebody is going slowly in front of us and we'll get angry on them as well. Like, come on man, hurry up. What's wrong with you? Can't you drive? And the guy hasn't even done anything wrong to us. He's just driving slowly because maybe he's tired or something. If only we could remember these things. It's about changing ourselves. May Allah give us the tawfiq.
He relates from Jabir radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear the ring in the right hand. That was the hadith. But by this hadith, alhamdulillah, we got the fa'idah and the benefit of knowing who these great people were. 